Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the WEB Du Bois Centre on this glorious day. <laughs> this beautiful Massachusetts seasonal occasion. Um, this is our first visiting scholar lecture of 2020, the first of this semester. Um, and we are really delighted to welcome Freedom Bloomer, uh, who is Associate Professor of Sociology and Education at Tufts University and co-chair for the Boston Consortium for Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women and Sexuality. His research examines the interplay of gender and masculinity, education, youth, feminist theory and black politics. Frieden is the author of the award-winning book, Black Boys Apart, Racial Uplift and Respectability in All Male Public Schools, and co-editor of Unmasking Masculinities, Men and Society. As a postdoctoral fellow at the Du Bois Center at UMass, he is undertaking two projects, a revival and reimagination of Du Bois's prayers, written between 1909 and 1910, with our scholar in residence, Philip Luke Sinatier, and Becca Lewis. Levis, excuse me. And a work of historical ethnography and historical fiction that uses Du Bois's Black Flame trilogy to reassess the politics, the promise, and the propaganda of modern US sociology. Please join me in welcoming Frieden Blumer. Thank you, Adam, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm excited to be back here at UMass um, to give uh, this talk um, in Du Bois' birth month, and just a few weeks away from the 10-year celebration of the center. And being a fellow has just been enormously uh, gratifying, and it's been a blessing to work with and learn with the people who passed through these doors. Thank you again for, for coming out. A uh, special thank you to Whitney, who couldn't make it, sadly, um, and Adam for their support and time, as well as the staff at the C, uh, SCUA. Uh, many of the archival documents in the PowerPoint, with a few exceptions, are from the special collections in the online repository, Credo. So my research on Du Bois is part of a larger shift in my work where I'm taking some time to think about how I can bring together social science and the critical humanities to explore my larger research interests in masculinity, feminist theory, childhood, and black politics. And I'm especially interested in learning and drawing on not just ideas and theories, but techniques, ways of knowing and approaching texts and archives, and so forth, from the humanities. And so Du Bois' Black Flame Trilogy, a work of historical fiction, what he called the fiction of interpretation, the focus of today's talk, is just the conversation partner I needed. My overall goals today are to help introduce the novels and explain why they matter today. Instead of going through the details, scenes, and characters, I want to help think through the book's big message and trace a genealogy for that message in Du Bois's life. First, a question. Who here um, has read the Black Flame trilogy? Who here is familiar with the text in some ways, maybe heard about? Um, who here, who's at the Du Bois Center for the first time? How's that? Great, welcome. Um, so a lot of my own work here is speculative and um, has even become quite personal for reasons I'll share in a couple of minutes. And there's a lot of ideas to work through regarding trauma, kin, grief, romance, prayers, and even medicine and math. But don't worry, there won't be a quiz at the end. <laughs> so Du Bois famously bracketed souls of black folk with a forethought and an afterthought. Words that capture an important temporal dimension to Du Bois' overall work and matters for my talk today. But Du Bois also referred to his writing process as a series of forethoughts and afterthoughts. When Du Bois' publisher for Black Reconstructions was waiting impatiently for the book, uh, in 1934, Du Bois responded that they would have to wait because my afterthoughts, by which he meant his polishing and revision, would take some time to complete. The publisher snapped back that they wished Du Bois had written his afterthoughts first. Um, so in Du Boisian fashion, um, I'll begin with a forethought on the archive, and I'll conclude today's talk with some afterthoughts of my in the postscript, postscript to the Black Flame trilogy, Du Bois offers these rather haunting observations, and I hope we can ruminate on them together in the next hour. Du Bois wrote, quote, After action and feeling and reflection are long lost, then from writing and memory we may secure some picture of the total truth, but it will be sorely imperfect, with much omitted, much forgotten, much distorted. If I had time and money, 
I would have continued pure historical research, but this opportunity failed and time is running out. So we start at the bottom with time is running out. I think we can draw out a couple of meanings here. Uh, first, Du Bois was writing at the end of his life, and the third volume was published when Du Bois was 92 years old. The phrase also hints at the remarkable te uh, uh, temporal registers in his writing and uh, historiography. And I like to think about ideas of acceleration and volition mattering here. If we think about how Du Bois was trying to speed up and commit memories to paper before time runs out on him. And last, the phrase hints at the book's uh, quite apocalyptic tone. Um, second is this fascinating line about memories and distortion. And what I want to stress here is that I think Du Bois is reflecting on the fact that he's run up against the limits of an available archive. An extraordinary thing given um, how abundant Du Bois' archive is here at, um, at UMass. And elsewhere in the postscript, he'll refer to the use of imagination to fill in those gaps. And last, I think this phrase about distortions is really extraordinary here. And I think what Du Bois is trying to do is not to reject distortions, but he sees those distortions as opportunities. Du Bois worked on the Black Flame trilogy as he was chipping away at what would become his third autobiography, which was published a few years after his death. Amazingly, the word archive uh, rarely appears in Du Bois' voluminous output but in the closing paragraphs of his autobiography, Du Bois uses the term in the plural to refer to memories and personal histories and perhaps other things. And I think it's really, really quite beautiful. So he writes, I live from year to year and day to day. I expect snatches of pain and discomfort to come and go. And then reaching back to my archives, I whisper to the great majority, to the almighty dead, and to whose pale approaching faces I stand and stare. You whose thoughts, deeds, and dreams have made men wise with all wisdom and stupid with utter evil. Across these observations, I want us to think about the instability, the uncertainty, and the lack of authority that Du Bois is trying to convey. And it's precisely where the formal archive of record keeping fails that we can entertain what Anne Svetkovich calls an archive of feelings, the vast, enduring, yet ephemeral archive of emotions produced as a result of trauma. About four years ago, as I was writing the conclusion to my first book, I learned of 71 prayers that the boys wrote between 1909 and 1910. I wasn't sure what to make of them, but I knew that I wanted to end the book with one of the prayers, and so I did. Around the same time, I learned the Black Flame trilogy um, was described as the sequel to Black Reconstruction, which he published in 1935. And I found, as I was trying to make sense of these two works, um, one which was a set of prayers for children, and the second, a trilogy and a family saga, that the words in, of, of Avery Gordon, quote, ghostly things kept propping up and messing up other tasks I was trying to accomplish. Du Bois observes Reaching back to my archives, I whisper to the almighty dead. I've come to wonder, what if you reach back into your archives and your memories and the dead whisper back? On June 17, 2015, a white supremacist murdered nine black parishioners during Bible study at the Emanuel American Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. One of the oldest black congregations in the nation uh, Emmanuel Church, or Mother Emanuel as it's known, was reduced to ashes after a failed slave uprising in the 1820s. And the city continues to burn with the legacies of slavery. North of Charleston in Greeleyville, the Ku Klux Klan burned Mount Zion Church to the ground in 1995. And in the weeks after the 2015 massacre at the hands of Dylan Roof, a number of black churches throughout the South were set on fire and arson was suspected. Between 1957 and 1961, W.E.B. Du Bois published the three volumes of his Black Flame trilogy. The first volume begins with a fire at Emmanuel Church, the final year of Reconstruction in 1876. One night, Tom Manzard accepts the invitation of a white woman to walk her home, and this seals Tom's horrible fate as he's lynched by a white, uh, by a white mob on the steps of his own home. Just inside, Tom's wife gives birth to a baby boy. As Du Bois writes, quote, 
Three cries rent the cold night, a howl of death, the scream of birth pain, and the wail of a newborn babe. The blacks in Charleston, in the trilogies, seek refuge from the mob violence in the Emmanuel Church. In one of the more dramatic passages in the trilogy, the newborn babe's grandmother walks in, naked, holding the bloodstained baby, and she cries out, Curse God, ride devils of hell with the blood-bought baby. Burn, kill, burn. Crawl with the snake, creep and crawl. Behold the black flame. The baby is given the name Manuel, a nod to both the church and invoking the Messiah Manuel, or the incarnation of Jesus as God. And the surname, Mansart, is also fraught with meaning. It's a combination of man and art, or man's art, signaling that Du Bois's works are art, but as he famously wrote, art as propaganda. The question I would like for us to think about today is what is the significance of the black flame? In the black flame, Du Bois's color line becomes a color spectrum. The white flame of white supremacy threatens to devour everything in its path. Manuel Manzart's mother burns with white heat. Other characters burn blue, crimson, and green. But in a pivotal scene in the book, the protagonist, now an adult, embraces the name given to him on the night his father was murdered, telling his own family, my black flame, quote, burns slow and dark and always. Among Du Bois's five novels, the Black Flame trilogy occupies an especially curious position. Beginning in the final year of Reconstruction and covering nearly all of Du Bois's life, the book tells the story of Manuel Manzart, the president of a Negro college, and his family across several generations. The details of Du Bois' own life are split across several characters in the novels, both men and women. The trilogy ends with Manzart traveling the world during the Great Depression and observing the extent of the gruesome American empire around the globe and offering an unveiled endorsement of global socialism. One of the earliest mentions of the trilogy in the archives is in a letter, a love letter actually, dated May 21st, 1941, from Shirley Grant to Du Bois about two years before the two were married. Earlier that month, Du Bois began writing the first volume of the trilogy in a French resort town. Shirley Graham gushed that, quote, it will be a masterpiece, the best you've ever done. And that certainly is saying something. But history hasn't been so kind to the books. The Black Flame is often difficult to get a handle on with its flights of fancy alternating with intricate historical facts, its religious imagery, characters who enter trance-like states, other characters who appear like crude stereotypes, its incoherent passages, and plot lines that are never resolved. And so I respectfully disagree with this quite marvelous 1957 newspaper ad announcing that the trilogy makes history easy to read. It definitely does not. <laughs> uh, this uh, is courtesy of the Herbert Affecker papers at Stanford. In fact, Affecker would prove to be Du Bois' saving grace. Having pushed, to the having pushed the margins by the civil rights establishment in the US, Du Bois struggled to find a publisher for his trilogy. It was eventually published by Masses and Mainstream, a Marxist press, um, press which Affecker had once edited. The book received mixed reactions from critics in Du Bois' time. A 1960 review of the book, uh, of the second book, in Phylon, a journal which Du Bois helped to found, wished that Du Bois, quote, had ceased to annoy himself and to irritate his readers. Sales of the first volume were so poor that the press didn't even bother, bother with accounting for the book. In this letter, the editor makes the snarky observation that accounting didn't matter anyways, since Du Bois actually had requested a majority of the copies from the press, and so Du Bois actually owed the press more money than the press owed Du Bois in royalties. Oh, I can relate. Um, <laughs> and so, how did I end up researching the Black Flame trilogy? To quote Ruth Behar, I had gone someplace to find a story I wasn't looking for. My first book was a qualitative study of two all-boys public schools targeted to black boys. I ended the book pondering the future of a newer all-boys public school, Washington, D.C.'s Ron Brown Prep Academy, which is featured here. In the picture of an assembly in the school's first days, the high schoolers form an outer circle, with the inner circle being a group of visiting students from Morehouse. I was struck by how the school motto is a line from one of the 71 prayers the boys wrote while at Atlanta University between 1909 and 1910. These are precious, frequently stunning invocations that offer moral lessons on how to lead a 
a virtuous life, and to have a healthy mind, body, and soul. The school motto and this prayer reads, Now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, not some more convenient season. While Athiker later published the prayers with the, the title Prayers for Dark People, the boys actually gave it the title A Creed, A Litany, and Diverse Prayer Set Down for the Darker Races of America. I was struck by this language, a creed, a principle of belief, a statement of faith. While the boys used children in quite capacious terms in his writings, referring not only to young people, but also to Af people of African descent as the seventh son, the children of the sun, the children of the moon, and the immortal child. But there's a hopefulness of the prayers that are shot through with tranquility and sadness and even anger. Indeed, Du Bois had written several important creeds that decade. His 1904 Credo, uh, a first-person invocation and statement of racial pride, which was later adopted as the name of the online repository of the archives here. And perhaps more famously, a litany of Atlanta two years later in response to the Atlanta race riots of 1906. As I was reflecting on the prayers, Alden Morris's groundbreaking text in sociology brought together the field like few books had. And, um, uh, Alden Morris spoke here a few years ago, in fact. So this book asserts that Du Bois is the scholar denied, that he is, in fact, the true founder of the first school of scientific sociology. In the United States. While I took great inspiration from this, I came to complicate and even feel troubled by this claim. I asked, who hasn't denied Du Bois? Who and what fields have long engaged Du Bois and may have even grown tired of Du Bois? When might it even be productive to deny Du Bois? In characterizing Du Bois as the scholar denied, how do we come to deny others? Who did Du Bois himself deny? What's lost in pursuing an origin story in order to set the record straight? What's lost in the pursuit of recovery? The achievements of this book notwithstanding, it's essentially a story about the struggles between leading men and avoids important discussions around gender. So we hear nothing about Shirley Graham Du Bois, and Morris's book ends with what I think is a quite debatable claim that Du Bois was the architect of intersectionality. I grew increasingly convinced that sociologists were having a rather insular conversation about Du Bois. I nodded approvingly with Rylan Rabaka, who has also spoken here, who has written that sociology evinces what he calls a disciplinary decadence with respect to Du Bois. Sociology had participated in what he calls an epistemic apartheid, segregating Du Bois in a way, or to borrow one of Du Bois' own phrases, had divided Du Bois against himself by, as I'll argue today, largely pushing into the shadows a private and intimate Du Bois set apart from the globe-trotting propagandist and world-renowned public intellectual, and by segregating the late career Du Bois from the early and presumably more mature Du Bois. And denials are also bound up in a politics of attraction. These opposing forces underscore Du Bois' use of, use of dialectical formations throughout the book. But drawing on the psychoanalytic tradition, I'm asking how Du Bois thought of these forces in an ambivalent terms, in ambivalent terms, as a simultaneous, even necessary existence of opposing forces, like a battery drawing energy from both a positive and negative charge. And so I returned to the prayers with different optics. While I had read them as Du Bois speaking behind the veil, or for an intended audience of school children, I came to think of the prayers as revealing Du Bois going beneath the veil, towing the line between the conscious and the unconscious, existing in the space where man's art is at the end of the trilogy, neither awake nor unconscious, but in a semi or half coma. Sociology's Du Boisian moment was itself embracing a creed that the public Du Bois, du Bois who makes principled statements regarding anti-racism, should veil the private and more intimate Du Bois. But if a creed is also a prayer, and prayers are yearnings, then what had the scholar desired? A phrase that serves as the unofficial talk uh, title for my talk. What did Du Bois deny or repel consciously or unconsciously? What were Du Bois's unfulfilled yearnings and wishes? 
And here I'm thinking of desire in quite expansive ways, including erotics and fantasies, but also extending to wishes and yearnings. My book was published two weeks after my firstborn, uh, my firstborn son was born. In the time leading up to his birth, I found myself reflecting on my own parents. Here's one of the earliest photos of the four of us. Missing are my older brother and my older sister, who I never met because they were killed in the Khmer Rouge, Rouge regime in the 1970s, before I became the first person in my family to be born in the United States. My family still struggles to talk about my parents' past, and my own yearning to acknowledge my positionality as a researcher finds me at a loss for words when I try to reckon with how being a child of genocide survivors might matter for my scholarly interests in Du Bois. My mom still grieves and prays nightly to the two children she lost in front of pictures, taking part in what Christina Sharp calls wake work, mourning for and keeping watch over the dead. Brent Edwards has written that there are, quote, different versions of the black flame without ever exhausting or fully explaining the figures reverberating mystery. I'll make the case today that the black flame should be read as Du Bois keeping, uh, as Du Bois mourning for and keeping watch over the dead. And that the death of his firstborn son, in conjunction with many traumatic events in Du Bois' life and the transition to the 20th century, ignited Du Bois' deeply ambivalent and fraught relationship with fire, a kind of master metaphor that encapsulates Du Bois' archive of feelings. Moreover, and here's where I'll turn next, we can make sense of the book if we understand how the experience of trauma also shaped the narrator's voice in the books, which I'll identify as the fourth person singular. Interestingly, Du Bois' trilogy invites a discussion about repulsion and attraction when he gives the trilogy the preliminary subtitle, A Romance of the History of the American Negro. There are at least three interpretations, I think, of romance. The first is romance as erotics. And uh, perhaps the most remarkable character in the novel is a woman by the name of Jean Dubignon, who is a composite of Du Bois, Shirley Graham, and likely Adrian Herndon, who is speculated to have been one of Du Bois's earliest lovers. Lorraine Carroll calls this a form of rhetorical drag when male authors write with, fil with uh, female pseudonyms, decisions that speak to larger questions about gender and sexuality. Um, also important here is that Adrian Herndon uh, was an African-American woman who passed a second meaning of romance is romance in its original meaning, referring to heroism and chivalry. And here we can think about the Black Flame trilogy as a work of propaganda, as chronicling uh, a chivalrous prophet mes messiah who strives to eradicate global racism. I think this, uh, among these three interpretations, is probably the most popular because the Black Flame is viewed as a sequel to Black Reconstruction, but I'm trying to offer alternative interpretation today. I want to highlight a third meaning of romance, uh, what I call the romance of the remnant, or a reckoning with the supernatural. And we see an early example of this um, in the books when Jean is teaching summer classes at a small college in Ohio. And I won't read the first paragraph, but what happens is she's giving a lecture and she suddenly enters into a trance. And her students uh, think that she might be dead, but here's what she tells her students. And beginning um, at the bottom here. Away down there in the Antarctic, at the end of the world, we have been building an ice palace. Nothing the world has seen is of such size. The inches of the pyramids have been yards in this massive and gigantic building. The Empire State Building is a mere uh, pilaster. The building already looms so that at the end of the globe, the earth soon will lurch and swinging outward into the barriers of the stars, lay open a universe with no assumptions of space nor hypotheses of time. So uh, Du Bois, of course, had quite a bit to say about black interiority. And I hope that my talk today adds to the scholarship on this topic by exploring how trauma surfaces in the books. And I won't say much now about the possible sources for his thinking on psychoanalysis, 
Um, uh, several people speculated Warner Solars, especially about what he calls um, a telepathic relay between Freud and Du Bois, who were contemporaries. And I'll mention Freud in a couple of slides. Um, but I will say here that um, my own suspicion is that uh, Freud's main inspiration for psychoanalysis um, was likely where uh, Du Bois got his early thinking on psychoanalysis, which is the work of Johann von Goethe, who was the main um, uh, inspiration for Du Bois' uh, theory of um, uh, uh, dreams. Um, so I'll leave that all aside for now, but uh, quickly just back to romances. So through the late 1880s, uh, William James's course on philosophy, which Du Bois took at Harvard, drew on the work in mathematics to develop a theory of morality. Du Bois was inspired in particular by the work um, on, on the fourth dimension of space-time, introduced by the mathematician Charles Hinton in his book Scientific Romances. On the right is an image that would appear in a later book by Hinton of a tesseract or a four-dimensional cube. On the left is another popular book from this era called Flat World, a work of satire that imagines society as a two-dimensional plane. It's hard to make out here, but the author is a, is a, a pseudonym. It's A square. Mm -hmm. It's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the meaning of romance in the title of these books? Here the word refers to the mystical or the supernatural, and I think this is the plane on which we can best understand the Black Flame trilogy. Scientific romance was an early term for a genre we now call science fiction. From these works, Du Bois would write an unpublished work of satire that first introduced the idea of life behind the veil. In this story called A Vacation Unique, a black pro uh, protagonist asks a white classmate to have an operation that would make him appear, appear black so that his classmate could see what life was like behind the veil. Du Bois called this veil, this early version of the veil, the fourth dimension. Du Bois took something abstract and hard to imagine, a fourth dimension of space-time, and made it concrete. I think this history matters because it hints at what Du Bois would later call historical fiction, because what Du Bois would later call historical fiction, I think, is best understood as a work of science fiction, a space and time-bending romance with the universe. Um, and it also, I think, highlights how Du Bois would be predisposed to thinking about the veil as having four dimensions, although we only typically think about uh, three perspectives on the veil. A year after Du Bois took um, a course with James uh, in 1889, Du Bois, uh, James published an article called The Hidden Self. And in it, he extolled the virtues of a new psychology proposed by Pierre Janet another founder of psychology, and which helped pave the way for psychoanalysis. And I'm struck by echoes of this language in Du Bois's autobiography. I'll read just a second paragraph here. Janet has been enabled to do this by tapping the submerged consciousness and making it respond in certain peculiar ways of which I now proceed to give a brief account. He's found in several subjects when the ordinary or primary consciousness was fully absorbed in conversation with the visitor, that the submerged self would hear his voice if he came up and address the subject in a whisper, and would respond either by obeying such orders as he gave, or by gestures, or finally by pencil writing on a sheet of paper placed under the hand. The ostensible consciousness, meanwhile, would go on with the conversation, entirely unaware of the gestures, acts, or writing performances on the hand. With all this in mind, um, I'm suggesting that Du Bois narrates a fourth-person point of view in the Black Flame trilogy. So the first three are, are much more common in Du Bois' writings. Um, and and to, to use just one example, um, in his essay dedicated to Burghardt, his son who died in 1899, he uses all three in the same paragraph. He refers to life through the veil, inside the veil, and above the veil. Through the veil, referring to being angry at the white world. Within the veil, uh, Du Bois and his wife Nina were grieving alone. And above the veil, Du Bois writes, sleep then child, sleep till I sleep, above the veil. With here, veil referring to liberation and emancipation. 
Um, but being above the veil also does something, I think, really fascinating with respect to the use of the first person and the third person, where Du Bois would refer to a third person, he, by substituting it with a first person, we. In other words, black Americans uh, were an objective, uh, represented an objective truth. And for example, in Prayers of God, this essay, um, he'll equate uh, African Americans with a black messiah, and therefore equate we with he um, in the same breath. Um, it's, I think, very easy to read the Black Flame trilogy um, as an example of the first person or through the veil, where we see a prophet who speaks to an international audience. I'm suggesting instead that Du Bois takes this very unique uh, narrator's voice, which is to go beneath the veil into the fourth person, which is the I that is not I, nor you, nor he, nor we. To be very honest, I first learned about the fourth person singular um, uh, in, in writings on video games. It's a big thing in role-playing games and RPGs. And the idea here is that RPGs or role-playing games are imaginary worlds which blur the line between the narrator and the audience, real and the imaginary. And uh, the actual term, the fourth person singular, comes from um, the beat poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Uh -huh. if and so, uh, just very quickly here, I'm sort of summarizing a lot of things from, from Ferlinghetti. So, uh, drawn from this 1960 uh, work of poetry, I define the fourth person singular as characterized by great instability and a lack of authority. The I, in this case Du Bois, is so diffuse throughout the text that it's never clear who's speaking and often what's real and what's imagined. And therefore, it provides an opportunity for the conscious and the submerged selves to speak all at once. The narratives, I think, also tap into uh, a couple of different fourth dimensions. They it, it manipulate the fourth dimension of time, and they also shatter the fourth wall, or the wall separating narrators and readers. Um, the scholar Joff Bradley, um, in reflecting on Ferlinghetti's use of the comment, uh, the concept writes, in the resultant loss of identity and the embrace of radical otherness, there is emergence of the fourth person singular. It is thus less a tale of autobiography and more an exploration of the irreducible gap between self and other. As such, the narrator is trapped in a story of his life in which he has lost control. Um, Again, we won't talk about too many scenes in the book, but I think this really makes sense if you begin to think about how several of the characters in the book who both represent Du Bois are speaking to one another, and on one level, it's Du Bois quite literally having a conversation with himself, constantly revising past events in his life, reflecting on them, and choosing to do odd things often, often with turning now to the meaning of the Black Flame. So 1899, as many people know, was an especially traumatic year for Du Bois. Mm -hmm. Sam Hose and the lynching of Sam Hose um, had a great impact on Du Bois, and he famously remarked that this lynching in, uh, in Atlanta uh, motivated him to leave uh, research and to take up a life as a propagandist. It's very important to recognize this history that Hose was not only lynched, but he was burned alive. As Ida B. Wells, writing in the same year, described it, local newspapers offered, quote, daily encouragement for the burning of black people. What haunted the boys was not simply that Hose's body was mutilated, um, but that his body was burned. I began the talk by describing an opening scene where Tom Manzard is lynched. If Tom's death is a symbolic representation of the end of Reconstruction in 1876, then his son's birth can be viewed in at least a few ways. Most obvious, it's that Manzard's birth symbolizes the start of Jim Crow. A second meaning that I think really takes on um, interesting sort of lives in the book is to see Du Bois giving his own life a new life. So it's a resurrection of sorts. Du Bois hints strongly at this throughout the books uh, because Manuel, who is a quite modest figure, in many ways lives through many of the same events in Du Bois's life. 
At the end of the first book, Manuel Manzart stands up before his family and he says, I am that black flame in which my grandmother believed and on whose bloodstained body she swore. I am the black flame, but I burn for cleaning, not for destroying. Therefore, I burn slow. A black flame also burns, but perhaps not so completely. I want us to keep in mind this tension that Manzart is drawing out between fires uh, as both cleaning and destroying. In fall of 2017, shortly before the birth of my son, my wife's doctor told me I need to get a Tdap shot. Does anyone know what the abbreviation for Tdap, all four things? Tetanus. Tetanus. Diphtheria. Pertussis is one of them. Okay. There will be a quiz answer. Is it polio? I'm not sure what the. Actually. <laughs> I'll leave it like two. Thank you. <laughs> what, uh, I learned that so D, the D in Tdap stands for diphtheria. So through the 1800s in both the U.S. and around the globe, diphtheria was perhaps the most feared of childhood diseases. In the mid-1700s, in fact, the disease, which is caused by a bacterial infection, which affects the mucous membranes of the nose and the throat, proved fatal for nearly one-third of all children under the age of 10. In the worst cases, the infection leads to inflammation of the throat and a growth of a large membrane, which restri restricts oxygen and leads to suffocation. For that reason, diphtheria was once called the strangling angel of children, uh, captured here quite hauntingly in a painting by Richard Tennant Cooper. Diphtheria appears twice in the mountain of data presented in the Philadelphia. The Negro, published in 1899, the same year. What's notable about diphtheria is this. It's one of the few diseases in Philadelphia that Du Bois documented that had a higher death rate for whites than for blacks in the city. Weeks after Sam Hose's death, these cold, hard facts would cripple Du Bois and his wife as diphtheria claimed the life of his firstborn son, Burghardt who had grown feverish, asphyxiated, and was dead within 10 days. Du Bois would later allude to this asphyxiation when he wrote, In Souls of Black Folk, Fool that I was to think that or wish that this little soul should grow choked within the veil. Du Bois had just moved from Philadelphia to Atlanta with his family, to the disappointment of his wife. It's now believed that Burkhardt would have stood a much better chance of getting an antitoxin in Philadelphia. In Atlanta, however, Du Bois could not locate any white doctors or even black doctors who were able to help, and so his son died within 10 days. In a really amazing piece by two doctors in the Journal of the National Medical Association, um, uh, these doctors reflect on diphtheria uh, uh, in the late 1800s, and they noted that Du Bois' son Burkhardt likely would have survived had the family stayed in Philadelphia, because they lived only a few blocks away from um, a very well-known um, hospital in the city now. And what made this hospital unique and, uh, and, and made it quite different from medical assistance available to the Du Boises in Atlanta um, is that it was a Jewish hospital. Um, it was the Beth Israel um, Hospital, and the B here is where uh, the Du Boises lived, and then the hospital, which had an antitoxin for Burkhardt, um, uh, is in the top, top right. So uh, I began my talk with a forethought, um, and Souls is actually remarkable. Souls of Black Folk is remarkable because there's actually a four forethought. Of course, it, in, in Du Bois is in fashion, right? This beautiful symmetry. Does anyone know, before the forethought to souls of black folk, what comes before? Anyone know? I will say songs. That, um, there are several copies of souls of black folk in here. Uh, the uh, the the Stover edition and this amazing recent edition from the UMass Press, and the UMass Press edition is unique for having the four forethought. It was a dedication. Does anyone know? To Burkhardt and Yolande. To Burkhardt and Yolande. And the phrasing here is, is very, uh, I think, really tragic. And so the dedication 
Do you know what, what follows next, Aaron? An another, <laughs> it's an another, another one of Du Bois's <clears throat> tragic dialectics. And he refers to, Bur to Burkhardt and Yolande, the lost and the found. The afterthought to Souls of Black Folk then makes a second allusion to Burkhardt's death, um, but in a different way, but is still no less tragic. He writes, Hear my cry, O God the reader, vouchsafe that this my book fall not stillborn into the world wilderness. Bill Mullen, in a beautiful um, interpretation of the Black Flame, writes, that the boys use the black flame to punish himself. One example that he gives is that Du Bois' is, um, I think, quite erroneous and uh, unfortunate interpretations about the place of Japan, Japan on the world stage was revised in the Black Flame trilogy, and Du Bois um, is much less uh, complementary to Japanese imperialism. I think. What Du Bois is doing with the Black Flame trilogy is that he's using it to convey his sense of grief over Burkhardt's death, and he's punishing himself for being what he saw um, as a failed um, or inadequate father, just as he had gained the reputation as the founder and father um, of African-American letters and American sociology. He punishes himself, too, because Nina, he would claim, died the same year, too. In his autobiography, he writes that when Burghardt passed away, Nina essentially died herself. And I think that a lot of this was on Du Bois' mind when Nina dies months just after he begins drafting the Black Flame trilogy. <clears throat> and I think it's reasonable that Du Bois would have taken on a special or even scientific interest in the disease that took his son's life and that he would have looked, I think, to the north. So in an issue published in the first volume of the Philadelphia Monthly Medical Journal, also 1899, and just weeks before Burkhardt's death, there was a review of the latest medical knowledge on diphtheria. As the review noted, diphtheria can quickly worsen when the elimination of cells gives rise and distribution to another toxin. The higher the degree of diphtheria toxemia, the larger the quantity of tissue toxins resulting, and the higher the degree of secondary or tissue toxin toxemia. The latter is fuel thrown upon the fire, for in a striking sense diphtheria is a bacterial fire, kindling itself upon the respiratory mucous membrane and burning into the tissues. The longer they burn or the hotter the flame, the deeper and more far-reaching the damage resulting. In an earlier um, uh, medical journal, the, the same phrase is used here, so diphtheria being a bacterial fire, and the author of this piece will uh, literally equate uh, diphtheria as a bacterial fire uh, to a person being on, um, on fire. A second fire haunts and burns of the passing of the firstborn, which is the essay in Souls of Black Folk dedicated to Burkhardt. In it, Du Bois implies that Georgia was on fire, or as he writes it, the earth there is strangely red, and therefore too dry to bury Burkhardt. His body was then sent north to be buried in the fertile Housatonic River Valley that Du Bois called home. So here I'm wondering if, as a result of the simultaneous deaths of Sam Hose and his son, when whites encouraged public burnings, in the words of Ida B. Wells, and while black children burned from within, the Du Bois came to link fires with trauma that's experienced and passed down intergenerationally, what we might call a psychic life of race. It's not normally seen in this way, but I think Du Bois interpreted Burkhardt's death as a lynching, but he, was, he, 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 he made few references to Burkhardt after his death in 1890. So that the immediate trauma expressed in prose in the souls of black folk had a cumulative effect on Du Bois. So at the, the end of his life, as he digs into his memories, his archive of feelings, a second archive that's there, 
but it's hard to see this archive because we're blinded by so many historical facts in the book that Du Bois is quite literally reckoning with his past. And so a man who whispers into his archives recalls the narrator and souls. The first person I, in an essay dedicated to his son, and he writes, my soul whispers ever to me, not dead, not dead, but escaped, not bond, but free. And I think there is this quite remarkable forethought and afterthought between Souls of Black Folk and the Black Folk Trilogy, where Du Bois is having a conversation about the, the trauma that he's had to endure over the death, uh, the death of his, of his son. And we don't have much time to talk about it now, but um, I, I will say that there is, I think, just an amazing, again, in the words of Warner Solers, a telepathic relay between Du Bois and the two dreams that bracket um, Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, which also amazingly came out in 1899. Um, does anyone know about either of those two dreams? The first is Irma's dream, and the second, uh, amazingly, is, the, is, uh, is, is called The Burning Child. And so in it, a child appears before his father in a dream and reproaches him. He says, Father, don't you see I'm burning? And Freud will interpret that as a father grieving how he allowed his son to die. The first dream, Irma's dream, is a dream which inspired Freud's uh, a theory of dreams. And it's remarkable because in it, Du Bois, uh, Du Bois, Freud, it's a Freudism. <laughs> Freud interprets uh, this dream of a young girl um, accosting him in the book as Freud uh, failing um, with another patient of his who has the name Matilda. And Matilda was the name of his daughter uh, who had nearly died um, several years before of diphtheria. And so both in a theory of trauma developed by, I think, Du Bois um, on the margins, and a theory of trauma that Freud developed um, quite explicitly and was a foundation of his work, were both built on um, the tragedy of, of diphtheria um, uh, and, and children. Okay, so 46 minutes. I'll, I'll wrap up here, but. Um, so a few, a few afterthoughts. So um, I'm hoping that in thinking through uh, the meanings of the black flame, that for sociologists certainly, uh, we can begin to, to really recognize the black flame trilogy um, as a source of social theorizing, um, and to take our attention away from the other trilogy of Du Boisian works, the Philadelphia Negro, Souls of Black Folk, and Black Reconstruction, which have grabbed the lion's share of attention from sociologists. But I think in order to do this, that soci sociologists and social scientists will need to draw on new and radical methodologies to ask questions about tone and setting and character development and mise-en-scene and so on, irony, and to ask how these literary devices might matter for social theorizing. I also want to suggest that in thinking through and sitting with the Black Flame trilogy, that we can help to develop what Moon Ki Jung has called an underdiscipline of sociology, one that truly and finally reckons with the afterlives of those extreme antisocial situations, which include slavery but also genocide. I think that what black studies scholars call an archaeology of black memories can help us get closer to the boundary between the social and the, and the antisocial. As Jung writes, buried beneath ever mounting uh, mountains of statistics, models, narratives, concepts, and theories of social science lies this elusive antisocial math. Anti blackness, part and par parcel of racial slavery and its afterlife, remains a foundation stone, an extreme antisocial condition of possibility of the modern social world and of the modern discipline that arose to describe, explain, shape, and critique it. One way of contributing to this underdiscipline of antisociology is to consider uh, the uses and meanings of ambivalent fires in Du Bois's work. Um, 
Scholars have often written about the centrality of fire under slavery as <coughs> deeply ambivalent. Fires, for example, were violent because they were used in irons to brand slaves. But fires were also used for resistance as arson to burn down the homes of slave owners, and fires helped light the way at night. What I'm hoping to contribute here is that by equating Burkhardt's death as a lynching and a burning, then giving his own firstborn son a new life in the Black Lamb trilogy, the Du Bois asks us to consider how there's a collective amnesia today around how disease and illness are both a form of intergenerational trauma, but moreover, how disease and illness are themselves examples and forms of extrajudicial killings. I can put it more bluntly. So how might we better imagine slavery's legacies if we reframe heart disease, the leading cause of death and one that disproportionately harms black Americans, as an extrajudicial killing? And heart disease here not only disproportionately impacts black Americans, but heart disease mortality is concentrated in the South. Eric Garner, who was choked to death by police in 2014, and whose death resulted in, in the, refrain, police, uh, the refrain against police brutality, I can't breathe, which haunted Du Bois and Nina. Garner, in fact, suffered from heart disease. Garner was murdered in the afternoon when he would have otherwise been at work, but he had, had previously had to leave his job with the New York Park Service because of heart disease. And I opened the talk with the 2015 mass murder at the Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina and how it prompted a series of arson fires at churches throughout the South. Fire-related deaths strongly correlated, fire-related deaths strongly correlate with poverty-level demographics and living in a rural location. In 2017, nine of the 10 states with the highest rates of fire-related deaths were in the South, and black men are most likely to die from fire-related deaths. And very quickly here, there's a beautiful um, way that Du Bois actually refers to the heart disease of Africa to, give, to describe the social character of slavery in, in Africa. And we'll talk about that um, now. We're already at 15 minutes. So just to wrap up, um, I just want to highlight just a few other things. The first is just to return this idea of denial um, and desire. I think I'm hoping that sociologists can really think more carefully about uh, Du Bois's intimate life and how that mattered for social theorizing. And the back uh, of The Souls of Black Folk here, uh, this uh, published by UMass Press, um, it's just quite incredible and, and mentions why Du Bois matters in the era of Black Lives Matter. And I would ask here that feminist politics would also force us to reckon wh with why Du Bois might matter in an era of Me Too. Um, so, who here has read Beloved by Toni Morrison? Mm -hmm. um, here I'll end with uh, Toni Morrison and Beloved. So, I think there's one word that best capture, captures what Du Bois is doing with his memories is the notion of rememory. A rememory is a powerful experience often born from terrible pain which resists amnesia even when it's shrouded in the quiet human desire to repress. And in this passage in Beloved Toni Morrison, um, the character of Seda is talking to her surviving daughter, Denver, to say that rememories of her child keep bumping into her. So, um, rememories and pictures have been on my mind a lot. Uh, it's my mom and my dad who I talked about earlier um, my, my mom prays every night in front of several pictures. So pictures of our surviving family, myself, my dad, me and my sister, but there are pictures of dead ones, loved ones, uh, none of whom I've ever known. They include a picture of my older sister, Malika, um, and one person is there, but there is no per picture there, and that's my brother, Savan, who died at the age of three months. No pictures were taken of Savan, um, which means golden Khmer, um, and he died a few months into the Khmer occupation, Khmer Rouge occupation in Cambodia. So I've often wondered, what are my mom's rememories of Savan? What pictures does she have of him? I wonder, especially now, because my wife and I chose to name our own firstborn son Savan. 
My mom often calls him Chao, which means grandchild in Khmer, but I'll sometimes catch her calling him Go, which means child. A child or her child, either way, I feel that my mom's rememories are, are bumping into me. And I'm learning to sit with what that could mean, and I want to be a part of a Du Bois in sociology that dwells in this archive of feelings. Thank you. interested in the extrajudicial killing part and um, uh, maybe you could elaborate more. I mean, typically, if it's a killing, there's some intentionality mm -hmm. and um, where do you get that? There's some in intentionality. intentionality. So, I mean, I, I mean, I can see how heart disease disproportionately affects because it's um, related to poverty and, and access to food and health and conditions and, and of course the poor of all races are disproportionately affected by that. Um, who is doing the killing, I guess? I think um, Yeah, is that what you mean? Do you mean like it's a class or do you yeah, mean like race? Spoke, it's often Aaron. Aaron, yeah. Aaron yeah. Which, I, didn't, I didn't catch it here. The rich. The rich. Yeah. I, I think I think we 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 get ourselves in trouble when we're always trying to identify a culprit. Okay. And I think certainly sociology, I, I think, you know, oftentimes we need to focus on the consequences and outcomes in order to drive policy to know that things are wrong without having to identify exactly who was pulling the strings. Right? Things are, you know, racism exists today despite a lot of people self-identifying as not racist, right? And I think with respect to the legacies of slavery, I think. Uh, I'm trying both to, to demonstrate here how Du Bois had a very difficult and ambivalent relationship with, with uh, Flames and Fires. And Flames and Fires, um, you know, 100 years after the Red Summer, you know, these race riots in Chicago where there was so much burning, and I think it has uh, that sort of valence to it but for Du Bois, for Du Bois, and I believe for a lot of other people before these antitoxins became widely available, diphtheria, which was the number one cause of childhood death in New England through the 1800s, was viewed as internal fire. And Du Bois took that, and I, 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 I'm speculating here that, that that captured Du Bois and it enabled him to sort of think about how trauma is passed intergenerationally. Um, because of the moments in Du Bois' life in 1899, he was able to link Burkhardt's death to the death of Sam Hose. And even, one, even though one was a public killing and the other was a private killing, they were both lynchings in their own way. Um, and Du Bois equated the strangulation of diphtheria to, to, to public burning. And so we want to think about extrajudicial killings today. We need not look always at excessive use of police force in public spaces. There are other ways that we can think about how that trauma is passed through generations, but has different effects that we don't normally identify as extrajudicial killings. Um, but I hope I've been able to make the case that you know, heart disease and other diseases themselves are byproducts of, um, of slavery. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really amazing. So many things to think about. But I was wondering, after our conversation this morning, about your journey in the archives. And while you were making all of those discoveries, what was it like? 
what helped you uh, make sense out of the trilogy that you found there and this whole um, understanding of fire as an element that you know oriented a lot of his writing? Yeah, I, I think what, one thing that really um, started to push me in this direction was a separate question. So this morning we had a conversation about how with a lot of research, you begin one place, and then, then you realize that you know you actually were supposed to study something else. Right? Um, and I was really fascinated by uh, David Levering Lewis's Lewis papers, um, and how what does it mean to write a biography of of a person who was considered the biography of a race, um, and who self-identified. Um, as the autobiographer of a race concept, as the, uh, the subtitle to, to Dusk of Dawn. And I was really struck by how Lewis, in a lot of his early papers, long before the, 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 the books were published, um, was asking really provocative questions that I don't believe ever make it onto the published page about Du Bois' psyche. And that revealed a couple of things to me. It, it, one revealed, and I've told a few people this, is, is that I, after writing my first book, I realized that I, 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 I should have been an historian all along. Um, I was fascinated with history. And there's a way that Lewis was talking about Du Bois' life and his intimate relations in a way that weren't totally satisfying to me. But it asked me to think carefully about a man who was making mistakes, who was living his life, who likely had regrets, um, and in, a, in other words, who was just a desiring human being. And the second I, 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 I came to ask how a really, um, I think, a, a, a politics of, a, a feminist politics could be used to understand Du Bois, then I began to ask similar questions about how we can queer the Du Boisian archives, to really question normative categories in the archive, um, and so this is all to answer your question here, and thank you for it, is there's so much out there on Du Bois, but I really wanted to ask who he was just as a person, mm -hmm. and who, and this happened just as I was thinking too about um, what it would mean for my wife and I to become parents for the first time, um, and also in conjunction with this work um, that, that I'm doing on prayers for dark people, and um, I realize this whole time, every day of my life, my mom has been praying for children. And so I should just ask this less about him being an intellectual or a teacher, but him actually praying for a child. Mm -hmm. And then um, once I asked how Du Bois is just praying for a child, mm -hmm. um, and then I think things started. wanted to ask more about the fourth person singular sure. a little more like could you show us it uh, could you do you have anything yeah. to, to sh like how did you distinguish that eye from other eyes and and are you suggesting that that could be like a, a method of, yeah. of way yeah I think so I and I um I, I only I got to this when when um, I, so Shamoon Zamir has one of my favorite books on Du Bois mm -hmm. and about uh, the use of the double consciousness in, in Du Bois' life. Mm -hmm. And he, he references this article um, that Du Bois, this essay that Du Bois wrote, where he refers to the veil as a fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's really just, it's so interesting. And then um, I, I tried to just place that in a historical context to ask why would that language matter to Du Bois in the 1890s? And then um, it turns out that the use of um, scientific romances, right, was all the rage and it was the precursor to science fiction. So that sort of led me to think that when Du Bois was thinking about the Black Flame trilogy as a romance, he was thinking about a romance of science, of science fiction. And then suddenly, you know, there are new questions asked about the supernatural and you know, blurring divisions between the real and the imaginary. And around this time, I was reading about uh, video games for a separate, uh, not just research, I was reading about video games. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a 
it's a lot of children's um, uh, literature on children's use of role playing games yeah. makes reference to um, this fourth person point of view that that captivates children, and that's very different from the first person singular, the, the voice of authority that's found um, in other media. And I was struck by, I was really struck by that language um, and how role playing games are often described as works of science fiction, right? People are able to kind of immerse themselves, and you can change characters in RPGs. It blurs the line between the player who is the player, right, but is also not quite the player, right, and, and, and so when I went and said, it, and so it's, it's not on the text in that, you know, it's, this is just a passage from Worlds of Color that a lot of people have tried to interpret because Manzart is on the subway and suddenly he has his trance and then he sees, you know, it's, it's one of several nightmares he has on the eve of, of, his, of his death. And so the first person singular can't quite capture what's happening here because it's it's unstable right but i think what i'm what, but it's what, not what, even what, i it's not even it, it's so it's, what, what i think was really amazing mm -hmm. is that with all these passages right the boys never lets you know whose memories they are mm -hmm. and and i'm, I'm really captivated by the idea that at the age uh he started writing when he's the books when he was uh, 82 years old and he admits that he doesn't have access to an available art more. And I imagine that Du Bois' memories that he thought were his own actually belonged to other people. I mean, that, that is remembering, right? Mm -hmm. when, and it, it's a collective experience, and so after a while it doesn't matter who, yeah. the memories keep bumping into Du Bois, right? Yeah. And so he might claim a memory as his own, but it could have, it could have belonged to Adrian Herndon, right. yeah. his first lover. Yeah. It could have belonged to Shirley Graham. There are instances in the book I, that, that appear to me as if Shirley Graham is actually writing the book for Du Bois, but we'll never know, right? And so it obliterates the first three, and I think the best uh, literary device that, that captures what's going on is something else, a fourth per and that's where your darkest desires and unfulfilled wishes can come through, and I think I, I only picked up her after, um, uh, reading about it online, and it is just, you know, I, I'm not a English research, and I don't quite get it. To be honest. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't quite. Get it. But it, it's about a painter, and what Ferlinghetti calls the fourth person singular because he actively tries to trick you into thinking that the narrator, the painter, in the book is speaking when it's actually Ferlinghetti speaking. And so after a while. You're so confused, but that's precisely the point. It's not a first-person autobiography anymore. But the fact that Du Bois set out in part to make it about his life, but it had the complete opposite effect means that, you know, memories and time and all these other dimensions were interfering with the writing um, and reflection process. And um, I think it could be something else, but the closest that I've been able to come up with is can I keep you going a little more? This is so great. Do you find yourself now wanting to write in the fourth person singular? Would you take that voice? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, what, what I'm trying to do with the larger book project yeah. is um, it's, it's social science, but I'm writing fiction. Okay. And so it's imagining yeah. okay. a series of fictional mm. letter writing relationships between the boys and others who mm. I think um, Freud especially, but also C. Wright Mills, a sociologist, who, who led remarkably parallel lives. Huh. And to ask how, if we just imagine these fictionalized relationships, that sociology would just be a much better discipline. It would get us closer to this underdiscipline of sociology. And I will say, Moon Key's in the back, Moon Key Jenkins in the back. And so um, I've been so inspired by this work. And I, you know, I think it's exactly the direction that our field should go in. I hope I, hope I didn't butcher interpretation of it. <laughs> Thank you. Joya. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joya. Um, one like very minor follow-up to yeah. Felicity is Abby, as, thank you. As you were as you were talking about this fourth person, it did keep making me think of like
like um, unreliable narrators that are sort of moving through time. Mm. Um, and I wondered whether that uh, echoed with you or not. Yeah. But I also, you, you've given us a lot of like sort of, um, I, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the way that you have of querying and sort of bringing a sort of different lens to the voice's intimate life. Because mm -hmm. um, you sort of hinted at it, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more. I think, what, you know, what I can say, and I appreciate the question in way, is that um, I'm arriving in the Du Boisian archives um, at a moment when my, my, so my interests are changing, but I'm also not a trained um, researcher of archival methods. And it's been, we had, a, I thought, a really great conversation with you this morning about when someone approaches the archives, what is it that you do, um, whether you have training or not. Um, but I, I've been so struck by how archives has emerged in some of the best conversations about Du Bois with people actually using it to be very critical of Du Bois. And so uh, folks in critical black studies, um, uh, Christina Sharp, and especially Saidiya Hartman, asking us how we can jeopardize the archives. Like, what, what do you do when there is no available archive that's authoritative? And I think after 80 years of living and writing and researching, Du Bois actually arrived at exactly that place. He, he saw that his, his archive was no longer available. And what do you do? You, you turn to memories. And, and, he, and, and he could no longer rely on previous frameworks and tools. And, and so he just... He just told a story about his life and in doing so revealed things about himself and his inner self in a way that both rehearsed and revised previous things in his life, but also gave him an opportunity just to say new things. And I think, I don't know yet what kind of sociology can quite capture that, but I think feminist frameworks and queer frameworks come the closest to asking us to think about how we can jeopardize and destabilize categories around like in a, a voice of authority who's a narrator in a text yeah. and Du Bois himself was so authoritative with respect to his first person is, is it, and we, there's so many examples of that but what do you do when you're no longer telling that and what do you do I think is that um, you turn inwards and you live out your life on these pages and remarkably the end of they end up being so many other people's lives. And I think I'm just struck by, um, there's a lot of beauty behind that, even though the, the books themselves are very dark. You know, it, it, man's are, spoilers ahead, uh, mm -hmm. dies at the end of the book. Um, and you know, he has a nightmare. And he, he can't even complete his last sentence, right? Mid-sentence, he, he dies. And his daughter Sojourner calls him a dissonant flame of protest. Um, and there's something really tragic to that, um, and I hope I've made the case that I think the tragedy was born in um, Bernard's death. Wow. Thank you for yeah, thank you. Yes, that's great. Thank you all for coming out.